Well, welcome back, uh, everyone, uh, to this, our second session of today. I thought the, the first session was absolutely terrific. Uh, so if that's a, 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 a message of what's, what's to come, then I think we're in for a very good time. And we have, uh, at the, for this session, four uh, excellent scholars who are going to talk on the subject of rumour and belief. Our first speaker is Eamon Darcy, who teaches at the University of Maynooth. He's the author of The Irish Rebellion and the Wars of the Free Kingdoms, which was published by Roy Dell and Brewer in association with the Royal Historical Society in 2013. His current work uh, looks at the circulation of news during the 1641 rebellion and its role in shaping opinion and provoking reaction and activism. And it is this subject that's the, that will take, he will take as the focus of his paper this morning, uh, which is entitled, So Many False Reports Are Spread Abroad That a Man Knows Not What to Believe, Fake News and the Irish Rebellion of 1641. Amen. What I want to talk to you today is about a very important event in Irish history, an event that was narrated in very specific ways, uh, and over time it had a serious impact over the formation of Protestant identities on the island of Ireland until, of course, this event was supplanted by other events in the Protestant imagination. And so what I want to talk today about essentially is the 1641 rebellion, but I think it's important for those of you who may not know much about the background. Uh, uh, to, I think it is important to provide a bit of context. Then I will talk about the outbreak of the rebellion and show how the early reports of the rebellion very much steered new publications and interpretations of what was going on before anything had really happened, which is really interesting. And moving on from there, I want to take a jump over to London and look at how English printers published news about the rebellion. And when we delve into that a little bit further, what we start to see is how news is being carefully managed by English politicians at this time, and indeed Irish politicians. And then what I want to do, in light of the, the uh, uh, keynote lecture yesterday, and as well as the final session yesterday as well, is take a step back and think about news cultures uh, uh, in broader terms in early modern Ireland. So first things first, to think about the background- Can we just, of, just a, a, a short, um, um, there's a slight uh, mic problem. I don't know if others are, are noticing um, so that we hear um, kind of a, of a, is that a better? whoosh. Yes, it okay. is. So much for the fancy headset. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll move on. So essentially the outbreak of the rebellion, I suppose to all intents and purposes, many of the causes were started a hundred years beforehand where you have the beginning of the reform movement in Ireland, you have the establishment of an Anglican or Episcopalian inspired Church of Ireland. And what is interesting here is that slowly but surely over the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, you have the, the supplantation of traditional elites with new English Protestant settlers. And these are first, second generation English settlers and they're Protestant. And largely their place at the top of Irish society is uh, uh, buttressed by reforms in the Irish uh, Houses of Parliament where Catholic influence is diluted, land holdings change radically where Catholic uh, land owning uh, 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 are diluted from about 80% to 40% over the course of about 40 years. And also we see the economy changing in quite radical ways. And effectively what you see uh, 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 is the social and politi re political relegation of the traditional elites. And these were native Irish, so Irish born Catholics, as well as old English. So these would have been descended from the original English invaders of Ireland, but also considered themselves to be Protestant or Catholic, excuse me. Um, so effectively what happens is, is you have tensions that are largely polarized along religious lines and you have an outbreak of bad harvests in the 1630s. You also have the calling of the long parliament in England in 1640. And because they're so determined to um, rid the Church of England of popish or Catholic innovations, rumors start to circulate in Ireland that there is a plot afoot 
by Puritans in the English Parliament to destroy Catholicism. And these rumours are disseminated by leaders of the Irish Rebellion, Sir Phelan O'Neill and Lord Conor Maguire. And they are effectively translating English new, or news from England into Irish to their soldiers, to their, to, their, to their rebel troops. And what's interesting is that the rebellion is supposed to take a two-pronged approach. And what you see is one force led by Sir Phelan O'Neill, who's MP for Dungannon, who's very much a part of the political system, but he leads troops to seize key fortifications in the north of the country in Ulster, particularly plantation towns. And then you have a second troop. Uh, and this troop is led by Lord Conor Maguire. They're supposed to take the seat of colonial governance in Ireland, Dublin Castle. But the rebels, they, they end up drinking in the pubs of Dublin. Um, and, you know, one thing leads to another and the plot is revealed to an informant called Owen Connolly. Now, what's interesting here is Owen Connolly by all accounts, was stoutiously drunk. Um, I know it's very early to talk about this in the morning, but you, you never know. It's five o'clock somewhere. And Owen, Owen Connolly is dragged into a room to sober up. And then he's interrogated. And he says, you know, there is a plot of thought to root out and destroy all Protestants and English in this here kingdom of Ireland. And straight away, the colonial authorities issue a proclamation blaming all ill-affected papists, all ill-affected Catholics, and they presuppose that a massacre, a widespread and premeditated massacre of English Protestants is occurring before anything has actually happened. It's really interesting. And when we jump to, to London then, you know, this news of a premeditated massacre spreads like wildfire, wildfire throughout uh, uh, the English presses. And what I think is interesting is when you take a step back, you can see particular strands of news that are being disseminated. You have this wonderful printer called John Greensmith, who's prosecuted for publishing fake news. And one of my favorite examples of this is this Captain Vall that we see here. Um, and this is an example of what Captain Vall gets up to. You know, think about how he's put, portrayed here. This is a barbaric, uh, uh, almost Scythian-like rebel, killing man, woman, uh, women and children, uh, committing uh, 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 crimes of sexual violence. And then if you look at the end of the quotation, you see the victimhood is being portrayed in very clear ways. These are blameless victims, innocent victims. And despite their innocence, the, tyr the tyranny, the barbarity of this rebel uh, 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 leads to their deaths. It's very interesting. But then there were others like John Rodwell who see this news from Ireland within a very different prism or paradigm. John Rodwell specialized in effectively pocketbooks. I suppose the size of my mobile phone, this, 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 this book here, would, would, this news book here would have been the size of your phone, fits into your pocket. And what Rodwell was able to do quite clearly was mix stories with imagery uh, uh, of the 1641 rebellion. This would put us from one of his publications but to him, this was just another example through which he could talk about uh, 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 Catholic barbarity. So Rodwell had actually made a name for himself publishing similar types of news publications about the Thirty Years' War. And other printers see 1641 in Ireland very much in that framework. They see it within that sectarian European modes of religion framework. And what's quite interesting is they pick up on the narration of violence that is rooted in biblical imagery. And we see here, there are two stock images, pregnant women being attacked and children's heads being dashed against the stones. We can talk about this afterwards. But it's also, if you look at the bottom right hand corner, interpreted within a colonial framework, what the Spanish did in South America. So the same imagery appears in Bartholomew de las Casas, um, it's translated into English as Tears of the Indians, okay? So that's what John Rockwell, that's the world of John Rockwell effectively. But then there are others, like William Bladen, like Tristan Wetcombe. And the, uh, Bladen is a printer in Dublin who sends letters to London that his son then prints. Tristan Wetcombe is the mayor of Kinsale. And what's interesting is, is he deliberately prints news and it's, that starts to have a sway with English politicians because at the time, England is eff effectively laying the foundations uh, to the past, to the English Civil War, to the English Civil War of the 1640s. 
And there's a key man in all of this, Henry Jones. And Henry Jones effectively was the head of a commission that gathered intelligence on the outbreak and course of the rebellion. And what happened in the winter effectively of 1641, 1642 was an outbreak of popular violence. So those very real fears of the colonial administrators uh, were realized. There were uh, uh, widespread killings. There was targeting of Protestant settlements and prominent Protestant uh, uh, figures in the local population. But what's crucial, and this is why news from Ireland was so important on the path to the English Civil War, was that the rebels claimed they had authority from Charles I. And this was the result of a fake commission uh, uh, fabricated by Sir Phelan O'Neill uh, where he literally copied a wax seal and slapped it onto a, a, another parchment, saying that we have authority from the English king for our, our actions. Very interesting. And what happens then is that Jones circulates this information to the man on the right, John Pym, and he is the unofficial leader of the of parliamentary opposition to Charles I here in the middle. And I think this is extremely interesting because Jones is drip feeding intelligence saying that the rebels are fighting for the king. And what we start to see here is something quite interesting about the stage management of news and rumors. Because if we look at this timeline here, we see the outbreak of rebellion. We see in England, you know, the failed attempt to arrest five MPs in January 1642. We see that very much the lines are being drawn between parliamentarian and royalist forces. And as soon as John Pym receives news from Ireland that rebels are fighting for the king, he makes a speech outlining the fears and jealousies of both houses of parliament. And he deliberately references the published news from Ireland, news disseminated by Henry Jones, disseminated by Tristan Wetcombe. And all of this is part of a rival effort to suppress the rebellion. Because Charles I said, I want to lead a force over to Ireland. And then as soon as he said that, all of a sudden intelligence arrives from Ireland saying, uh -uh, no, they're fighting for you. So the English parliament then sets up their own scheme to fund an army. And this scheme was funded by the Adventurers Act uh, passed on the 19th of March. And what's very interesting after this act has been passed is that positive news from Ireland starts to appear in print. And this is because they needed people to invest money up front to fund an army to suppress the Irish rebellion. One of the first instances of this is almost within days of the passage of the act. Henry Jones has called upon his clerical allies and colleagues to disseminate more positive news. They respond with the successful repulsion of the siege of Drogheda and they say, Oh, the rebels regret what they do. Even some of the more prominent ones are turning their ha are, are, tur are, are turning themselves in to the colonial authorities. It's simply not true. But then there's this, a proviso. Oh, I heard about the act. Please invest in the act. I think it's a good investment. And we, what we start to see here is very much over the course of, this, of, of March, April and May in London, far more positive news being disseminated. And this is where people started to get confused. So many false reports, reports are spread abroad that the man knows not what to believe. And this is extremely interesting because it went from one swing of Protestants are being killed in their thousands to, oh, actually things aren't that bad, you know, you know, I think the rebellion's going to end soon. But then there was also a realization among the printers that there must be a thousand killed, otherwise the paper will not sell. And that's the lasting legacy. And this is the narration of the event that lasts. This is the one that has the impact over centuries, essentially. This is the new cycle that survives, not the positive previous new cycle, but this one. And I just want to take a step back because I was really struck yesterday when we were talking about neglected voices, neglected sources. And of course, when you're looking at the circulation of news in an early modern context, our eyes are drawn towards literate sources, but we cannot overlook the oral world in which a lot of these people lived. And in the particular Irish context, there is a couple of ways in which there were a couple of barriers that influenced the circulation of news. And one is a language barrier. If news is circulating in English, it needs to be translated into Irish. The vast majority of people were Irish speakers. You had maybe one in five people, we think, who were bilingual brokers. And they must have played a key role in the circulation of news, much like Sir Fadon O'Neill. 
There's also limited access to a printing press. The government press at Dublin is not interested in disseminating news about Catholic politics. And even when the rebels form a government called the Confederation of Kilkenny, even when they have access to print, they're not interested in using news or print as a means of facilitating debate. They want to be very, very careful about what news they are circulating. And why? Well, this is because Irish Catholic politics in the 17th century were fundamentally divided over the status of the Catholic Church. Do we want a full restoration of the church as it was prior to the Reformation? Or do we just want tolerance, freedom to practice it privately in our own homes? And this was the issue that divided the Confederates throughout the 1640s. And this is that rebel movement I was telling you about. And the Confederates very much tried to stifle news about settlements with the king. News was leaked that a full toleration was coming very deliberately by the man on the right, uh, the Duke of Ormond. He tried to leak the full toleration was coming, but actually he was lying. His own tolerance of Catholicism was going to be uh, 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 um, uh, uh, envisaged by Charles I. And what he tried to do was issue a proclamation of uh, uh, calling for a peace in 1646. And he said, okay, the printed Oh, I think we've lost Eamon. Give him a couple of minutes to come back in. wonders of modern technology. <laughs> Let's see if Eamon can come back. It was a bit like listening to him over long wave radio for a while there, wasn't it? <laughs> he hasn't been cancelled or anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I, that's what I get for bad mouthing Ormond. Um, <laughs> I, I will finish. I apologise for that. Uh, I will finish. Effectively, you know, we don't need to see my final slide, but I was very much influenced by the the the, the keynote yesterday and our discussion in the evening uh, uh, in the last session about this idea of you know looking at news cultures in their broadest sense and not losing sight of those neglected voices, those neglected sources. And the other point that I wanted to say is that when we do start to look at these neglected sources, these neglected voices, I suppose um, what we see uh, really challenges that theory about a, a, a collective consciousness. I mean, what you see here in Ireland is, you know, even within the supposedly ethnic and, 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 and religious groups, there were vast differences of political opinions. And in ways, news reflected that, and in ways, news manipulated it as well. Thank you all very much, and I apologise for the technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Eamon. It was, it was a, a round of applause for struggling through the, uh, uh, the, the problems that you were having too. And I have to say that you, your voice, voice sounded much clearer that when, you, when you came back in uh, through Zoom. So, uh, our, our second speaker is Roseanne Bars, who's a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam. Her monograph, Rumours of Revolt, Civil War, and the Emergence of a Transnational News Culture in France and the Netherlands, 1561 to 1598, will be published in hardback in Brill's Library of the Written Word series, uh, volume number 88, um, uh, in just a, just a few months, months. I noticed from the website, in fact, that um, it's, it's, it was available as an ebook as of yesterday. So uh, for all those who want to uh, read it. There's, that looks like the fantastic chapters in iconoclasm in the 1560s and uh, the circulation of, of news of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre look particularly appealing chapters. This morning she will speak on the subject of rumour and news credibility during the early years of the Dutch Revolt 1568 to 1580. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, 
Yes, I heard an echo, not anymore. Um, and thank you so much for letting me present a paper at this wonderful and stimulating conference. I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, on 13 October 1572, a rumor ran in Antwerp that the King of France had been murdered. This, however, soon proved false. An Antwerp chronicler, Jan van Wezenbeke, duly added Postea Falsum to the diary entry stating this news. In this paper, I will discuss rumor and news credibility in the Netherlands in the second half of the 16th century. I will demonstrate that the Dutch revolt stimulated the emergence of a public of critical news consumers. Religious strife and civil war charged news with a special urgency and furthered the use of propaganda. False news or disinformation was deliberately used as a weapon to discredit the enemy. Trustworthiness became even more essential than in peacetime and many sources testify of contemporaries learning to assess the veracity of news and the authority of its sources. Uh, and diaries often recorded the news that reached their town. Um, also oral news in which I was particularly interested. Uh, and in my research, I've looked at 51 chronicles from France and the Netherlands. Um, yeah, well, I've studied these chronicles and uh, well, I've compared them, of course. Uh, and I've additionally studied a great deal of um, correspondences and pamphlets. And these chronicles were uh, written by, uh, well, predominantly male well-to-do urban citizens, often with a background in law. And they testify to an inquisitive and politically engaged public. So these diaries, they have allowed me to study how contemporaries reflected on news. Um, and as a study of many events demonstrate, chroniclers extensively recorded their troubles and worries in their search for reliable facts. Remarkably, even if they edited or copied their notes later, they often included reports that had proved to be untrue. In those cases, as we have seen in the earlier example, they added remarks such as this proved to be a lie to the news report. Uh, and here you see some quotes from the chronicles that I've studied. To the left, you see um, some chronicles uh, on the rumored defeat and death of the Prince of Condé in France in 1568. And one chronicle said, uh, everyone here says that Condé was captured and 1500 of his troops were defeated. This turned out to be a lie. Uh, and a fellow citizen said, everyone speculated for a long time whether Condé was alive or dead, but at last we heard the truth. However, some people for a long time refused to believe that the Prince had actually died. Um, and during the wars, they even become, became more, um, well, critical to news reports. And, and uh, on the right, you see a chronicle from Groningen in 1590, who said, who wrote in his diary, never was there a time more suited for the dissemination of rumors. After all, people mostly follow their emotions. They forge and shape news reports as they like to favor their own party by adding something, leaving fragments out, yeah, even by inventing news reports and recreating them from their own imagination, I have caught very many guilty of doing just this. So who was to be trusted in times of civil war? Whose authority was deemed credible in confirming rumors? Um, and there are some difference, well, there are parallels and difference between the Netherlands and other countries. And I'm looking forward to discuss well, various countries with you and compare cases. Um, and as my research from France and the Netherlands demonstrate, um, generally chroniclers from the Netherlands reflected more often on the credibility of news reports than did their colleagues in France. They habitually recorded their suspicion that religious opponents had planted rumors or that they spread only news that was favorable to their co-religionists. An explanation for this abundance of critical media reflections in Netherlandish chronicles might be 
that chroniclers in urban metropoles in the Netherlands simply received more diverse news reports. This allowed them to compare sources and contemplate matters of trustworthiness. In France, by contrast, with exception of those diarists who lived in Paris, chroniclers often had to be satisfied with whatever news they received. Mark Greencross and Tom Hamilton, for instance, who have studied the Parisian diarist Pierre de L'Etoile, have demonstrated that he distinguished between bruit and nouvelle, rumor and news. Recordings of events that had turned out to be true, he called nouvelle, while those that had proved false, he called bruit. And we can detect the same phenomenon um, amongst Netherlandish chroniclers. In his work on Mary, Queen of Scots and French public opinion, Sandy Wilkinson has pointed out the extreme radicalization of, of, of opinion in France during the propaganda campaign of the League at the end of the 1580s. Uh, and we see the same patterns in the Netherlands, where in the 1580s and 1590s, the outlook of Netherlandish chroniclers and their loyalties became more international. The declining authority of le legitimate rulers in both countries fostered an international outlook in which religious loyalty replaced dynastic loyalty. And chroniclers began to discredit all information that came from the opposite camp. So how did the chronicler living in a city buzzing with rumors acquire certain information? Chroniclers distinguished various rankings in trustworthiness. Um, and I would like to consider news a news report, for instance, a siege of a faraway city. So how did people verify which news was true, how to receive corroboration for a rumor? Um, and I've made a list. Uh, I've ranked news genres and news media uh, from highly trustworthy to doubtful. Um, and I hope to stimulate a discussion. Uh, I would like to hear what you think about this ranking. So I would begin with official correspondence from authorities. Um, these correspondence is often uh, letters from a stadtholder to the king, for instance, or from, from a general to the city magistrates. Uh, this was considered uh, the most tr trustworthy source available. Um, not only did high officials maintain wide international correspondence networks, they were often uh, also often the first to be official notified when a major event had taken place. And here you see an instance from a chronicler from Amsterdam on the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre. Um, and he said that it was said, so again, this oral news, but based on a letter. So it was said that the stadtholder almost certainly has received a letter that says how the Admiral so Coligny in France was killed by the king. And some chroniclers uh, um, ranked among the important city officials themselves and were allowed to see the official letters. So a Gent chronicler, Marx van Varnewijk, he often recorded that he had seen a letter with his own eyes. And if not that highly placed, it helped to live close to important officials in order to stay abreast of the latest news. After a courier had arrived with a message from an important official, the content was often quickly passed on in the corridors of the court and duly went out on the streets. Um, and my second source, my second genre is letters from family members and friends. Uh, right below official letters came letters written by family members or the family members of neighbors, friends. Um, and I found it rather surprising that amidst the chaos of battle, sieges and marauding bands of soldiers, many contemporaries managed to maintain correspondence with friends and relatives all over the country and even abroad. These correspondence usually included the latest news. Uh, and the Gent chronicler, Marcus van Varenwijk, again, he complained at some point about being unable to verify a rumor because he had no access to the services of a trusted friend or relative or a secretary who could inform me about current events. And then we have the official news services, of course. Uh, that were only available for members of the elite. Uh, and I have researched the case of the arrival of news surrounding the Battle of Moker Heide, a battle um, in April 1574 between the Dutch and Spanish troops in the vicinity of the city of Nijmegen. 
Um, and the battle being of huge importance, uh, um, a clergyman Morillon, he was an advisor of the Cardinal Cranfell, he had subscribed to a new service in Limburg that brought him fresh news about the battle every hour. So every hour he received new letters about this battle. Uh, then we have celebrations. And because news could remain uncertain for weeks and sometimes months. So when did 16th century chroniclers experience closure? The feeling that, had, that they had finally found out what had really happened. Um, and I see that chroniclers in the 1560s and 1570s stressed the importance of Thanksgiving ceremonies for the establishment of the veracity of an event. For instance, when on 29 September 1572, after weeks of uncertain rumors, a lackey arrived in Amsterdam with the final news of the surrender of the city of Mons to the Duke of Elba. This news was validated, as a chronicle termed it, through the ringing of church bells all over Amsterdam, processions and the singing of the Deum Laudamus during high mass. Another source uh, of news were, of course, travelers, people who had witnessed an event. Uh, and chroniclers often reported the arrival of travelers in their town who claimed to have been present at the siege or have talked to people that who had been. Uh, and in these cases, uh, the social status of the messenger contributed to the trustworthiness of a report. David Randall, for instance, has written about this topic for Elizabethan and, and early Stuart England. Uh, and French chroniclers in particular often recorded noblemen arriving in their city to share news about the battle. And generals would indeed send highly placed nobles to report a victory or defeat to lend style to their news report. Chroniclers in the urbanized low countries, however, mentioned considerably fewer noble news messengers than did their English or French colleagues. Instead, we see a lot of Netherlands chroniclers referring to merchants, wandering preachers or soldiers arriving with news. In the process of assessing the truth of a report, much depended about the background of the chronicler himself. Clergymen, for example, were generally more disposed to believe the reports of fellow clergymen. When no official or personal letters were available, one could always assess the veracity of oral news using simply waiting to see how long a rumor would persist. Uh, and the longer it circulated, the higher the chance of the report being true. And another approach involves comparing uh, various oral sources to see if they would corroborate one another's story. And my last genre are, are news pamphlets. Um, and I would argue that news pamphlets did not play such a prominent role in contemporary daily media consumption as historians have frequently assumed. Well, at least uh, in this period in the 1560s and 1570s. And chronicles from, from these years, um, these chronicles abound uh, with oral reports, with letters, uh, yet they mentioned very few pamphlets. Uh, and this changed from the late 1570s onwards when chroniclers began to mention the occasional pamphlet. Then we see how after receiving the first oral reports, chroniclers use pamphlets to become familiar with the background of an event and learn the reasons for a certain act or in a dispute, acquaint themselves with the argument from the other side. Many pamphlets assumed that the reader was already familiar with the particulars. 16th century media consumers proved as critical of printed material as they were of other news sources, And this is, of course, before the rise of the, the newspaper. Um, and they did distinguish, for instance, between common polemical pamphlets and official edicts that were issued by a magistrate or king and signed officially. And they often stressed seeing the signature on a pamphlet. So to conclude, um, firstly, in these years, a great importance was attached to official correspondence in verifying oral news. 
Uh, and this changed in the course of the civil war with the radicalization of opinion in the 1580s and the declining authority of the legitimate leaders. Secondly, it was easier to be a critical news consumer when one lived in Antwerp than if one were an inhabitant of a small town. And diarists in remote regions were content when they received any report at all. And their chronicles demonstrate far less reflection on the reliability of news. And thirdly, although news always spread fast, obtaining certainty was a privilege of the elite who had access to information sources unavailable to members of the lower classes. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. That was great, Roseanne. Thank you so much for that, that incredibly um, interesting paper. Um, I've got a whole barrage of questions, which I, but I think there'll be lots of competition later, so I'll, uh, I'll hold back just now. Our, our next um, uh, speaker is uh, Paniotis Georgakakis, who graduated uh, from the University of Athens with his BA and MPhil before heading to Calder Climbs. Uh, up in St Andrews, where he's currently working on his doctorate with uh, Professor Andrew Pettigree and Arthur Verduven. Um, he's interested in the social cultural history of the French Huguenot community, specifically the French language Gazette, published in the Dutch public after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Um, he's got, he's a, you know, surprisingly productive, much more productive than I ever was as a, as a doctoral student. Uh, with a number of, of articles and chapters either out uh, uh, at the moment or forthcoming, including one fantastic um, uh, contribution that I know formed part of a conference at Marsh's Library uh, last year, uh, which was organised uh, by Jason McGilligan. Today he'll talk to us on the subject of media in wartime, Huguenot Gazettes during the wars of King Louis XIV. Thank you very much and uh, thanks again the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my research and of course to be a part of this uh, magnificent uh, conference. Let's hope that uh, next year we will be all together in the same building discussing our research. So I will share my, my PowerPoint here. So I will uh, go one century later than Rosanne's excellent uh, paper. And I will show you again France and uh, the Netherlands. But uh, that time with the Huguenot Gazette uh, as uh, the protagonist of the news. So on 5 uh, September 1695, Nouvelle Extraordinaire the supplement of a Huguenot Gazette published in the Dutch Republic entitled Gazette of Amsterdam was focused on the capitulation of the fortress of Namur from the Allies during the Nine Years' War. The report started, open vote. We have just been fully clarified on this great event, which kept all of Europe on hold. It was God's pleasure to be victorious, the fair arms of the Allies, in a time of crisis, where all minds were divided between fear and hope. It was a time of woes and prayers, which is fortunately changed for the common cause into a happy time and thanksgiving. The, this important fortress that the French believed to make impregnable, defended inside by an elite army headed by a marshal of France and outside by an army of more than 100,000 men, held only as much as it took to make the conquest more of it." Close the quote. Huguenot Gazettes published in the Dutch Republic were active during the Nine Years' War. They, they presented news and reports from all the fronts and often confronted the authority of the French, since the attacks against French policy were frequently. Moreover, their main target was the State Gazette of France, La Gazette. La Gazette was established on 30 May 1631 by Theophrast Renandot, sorry, who had as his primary goal to gather news about the Thirty Years' War. Soon, his newspaper was granted a monopoly in the publication of serial news and became an instrument of propaganda of the French court and especially of Cardinal Richelieu. His successors followed his steps. As a result, La Gazette was the target of the foreign newspapers, 
which were trying to challenge its dominant of the French market, especially after the emergence of the Huguenot Gazettes during the 60s, 70s. Every newspaper, however, deal differently with Renato's Gazette. The above report illustrates the attitude of the Huguenot Gazettes towards France. Yet, this attitude varied depending on the relationship between the Huguenot editors and the French authorities. In this paper, I will present how the Huguenot Gazettes confronted their reports coming from the French side during the Nine Years' War. Dutch Republic had a strong tradition in publishing foreign language gazettes, and French language gazettes were the most popular ones. In fact, the first known French gazette was published in 1620 in Amsterdam, and it was a copy of a Dutch Corando. Until the beginning of 1670s, French language gazettes were publishing in the Dutch Republic from Dutch publishers. All that will change in 1671. Alexandre Lafont, a Huguenot scholar and refugee, will be the first Huguenot who will publish a French gazette. De Lafont was a copywriter and an editor of Gazette d'Amsterdam, a French language gazette that was published by the Dutch Cornelis van Svol. De Lafont left his position in Gazette d'Amsterdam around 1676 to 1677, and he moved in Leiden to establish his Nouvelle Extraordinaire de Diverte Droit, or Gazette de Leyde, as it well known. Until recently, we believed that Gazette de Leyde was the first Huguenot Gazette that ever published. But new findings came to light after my visit in BNF. I have discovered that De La Font was also the publisher of another Huguenot Gazette back in 1671, when he was the editor of Gazette d'Amsterdam. The title of this Gazette was Memoir qui servira la composition de la Gazette d'Amsterdam. As the title indicates, this venture had a strong connection with Gazette d'Amsterdam. Indeed, Memoir was circulated every time that Gazette d'Amsterdam was prohibited. Lafont often had to deal with the Dutch authorities because of the aggressive reports that Gazette d'Amsterdam hosted in its pages. These reports were not only against France, but against highly Dutch officials as well. As a result, Lafont covered this vacuum by publishing a Gazette of his own, Memoir. The circulation of this Gazette was irregular as it was dependent on when the Gazette d'Amsterdam was banned. Gazette de Leyde, however, remained the first, first French language Gazette that was published outside Amsterdam. From 1677 until 1789, more than 18 French language Gazettes were published in the Dutch Republic. Many of them did not last through time, but some managed to circulate until the beginning of the 19th century. The most famous among them were Gazette d'Amsterdam, Gazette de Leyde, Gazette de Rotterdam, and Histoire Journalière. However, more Huguenot Gazette appeared during the Nine Years' War, as we will see. But first, let me present the historical context. In 1688, France was the strongest military force in Europe. At the same time, the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I was engaged in a war with the Ottomans. Louis XIV seized the opportunity to extend France's influence among the German princes as the emperor was occupied in the East. Louis XIV was not expecting a long conflict. In addition, he supported King James II of England against William of Orange, stadtholder of the United Provinces of the Netherlands, who wanted to overthrow him. King Louis was confident that English and that English help would eventually come after King James overcame his rival. On the other hand, Leopold had already formed the League of Augsburg by 9 July 1686 to oppose France's expansion. The electors of Bavaria, Saxon and the Palatinate, along with the kings of Sweden and Spain, were the main members of this alliance. In October 1688, a French army to the Palatinate under the orders of Louvois, but Louis XIV's plans were ruined. In November, William had mounted a swift and successful campaign against James II. As the new King of England, William III crushed the Jacobite counter-revolution that Louis supported, and he was ready to unify his forces against France. In the meantime, the United Provinces of the Netherlands and the Elector of Brandenburg had joined the Grand Alliance. The war expanded to the American colonies as well. In Europe, 
The warfare was characterized by slow and careful sieges instead of huge decisive victories. The main battles were fought in the Low Countries, with Spanish and Italian regions soon to follow. The death of Louvois in 1691 and his replacement by the moderate Simon Hernand de Popon led King Louis XIV to wonder if his objectives in Europe were at risk. The French were weakened more in 1695 with the death of the great general, the Duke of Luxembourg. In 1696, Louis XIV's effort for peace started to have some results. Savoy signed a separate peace with France in June 1696. Three months later, the conflict came to an end with the Treaty of Rieswick. Excuse me for the pronunciation of Rieswick. Immediately after the beginning of the war, a new Huguenot Gazette was emerged in Amsterdam. Its title was Nouveau Journal Universel, and it grabs the opportunity to fill the gap after the ban of Cornelis van Schools in Amsterdam. Nouveau Journal Universel was a short vetour, circulated from November 1688 until March 1690. The publisher of this venture was the Huguenot Claude Jordan. On 14 March 1690, Jean Tronchil de Braille asked permission to publish a French Gazette himself. On the same day, de Braille signed a contract with Jordan, showing that the first was the main editor of Jordan's Gazette. On 20 March 1690, an advertisement appeared on Nouveau Journal Universel informed its clientele that, open vote, Claude Jordan, the editor of the Nouveau Journal Universel and former editor of Gazette de Laid, has been authorized by the city magistrates to print Gazette d'Amsterdam as well, closing uh, the quote. Seven days later, the first issue of the historic newspaper was circulated again, that time by a Huguenot publisher. Thus, the second period of the Gazette d'Amsterdam began. Jordan will remain as a publisher of Gazette d'Amsterdam until the beginning of 1691, and Dubreil will take his place. Soon, other Huguenot Gazettes started to appear. During the entire period, this entire period, the French Gazette published in the, Dutch, in, in the Dutch Republic were flourishing. They were able to provide the readers with news from all the major diplomatic, political, and military events. The reports are mainly focused on the capitals of the countries that took part in this conflict. Editors prefer to present these reports under a simple description of its geographical date, and they did not use any headline to describe the content of the report. A report from Paris, for instance, may have included news from both the city itself, but also from other French cities like Marseille or Rouen or uh, Dunkirk. The tone of presenting the news varied. That makes sense, since every gazette targeting different groups of readers. Some of the Huguenot gazettes were aggressive against France, while some others were more than friendly. That was the case with Claude Jordan, the former editor of the Nouveau Journal Universel at Gazette d'Amsterdam. Jordan had obtained at that time two privileges of publishing two gazettes, the Gazette d'Amsterdam and the Histoire Abrezé de l'Europe. The latter started circulation at the beginning of 1690. The reports appearing in this gazette were favored the French and was critical against the new English King William III. On 20 March 1691, Jordan placed an announcement under the Paris report declaring his loyalty to the King William and Queen Mary, an action that indicates that he felt under pressure by the Dutch authorities. Jordan will not stay long in Amsterdam because of his friendly attitude towards France. Two months later, he returned to France and he became a historiographer after he obtained the protection of the king. The example of Jordan was the exception. The other Huguenot editors were either aggressive or neutral towards France. On 2nd July 1695, the Allies started the siege of Namur, a city that lies between Charleroi and Liège, and it was under the French hands. Two days after the start of the siege, Gazette d'Amsterdam presented the numbers of English forces that would participate in that siege. The rest of the Huguenot Gazettes would follow. The siege lasted for three months, and its development was the first concern of the Gazettes. The reports coming from different arrival camps agreed about the outcome of battles outside Namur. However, 
Many of these reports were outdated and often another report coming from a closer city or camp was sharing new information, even in the same Gazette. Thus, the Gazette Amsterdam on 5 September 1695 hosted a report coming from the French camp in Namur on 30 August that informed its readers about the maneuvers of the French army, while the last two reports of the same issue celebrated the capitulation of the fortress of Namur. These reports were put at the last minute in the Gazette as they have no city headline. The supplement of the Gazette praised the Allied forces about this magnificent victory, as I have presented in my opening of my paper. Gazette de Rotterdam on 8 September also confirmed the outcome of the siege, praising the English King and the Allies about this victory. Gazette de Rotterdam spent two pages on presenting the news from this glorious expedition, as they said. On the other hand, La Gazette, in its issue published on 10 September 1695, in a few words, admitted the loss of the city. Nevertheless, Efsev Renato II claimed that was a Pyrrhic victory for the Allies as they lost almost all of their army. Almost a year after the beginning of the siege of Namur, France was preparing to attack Turin, the capital of Savoy. In the issue of Gazette de Rotterdam, published on 7 June 1696, we are informed that the French army had settled down in three different camps preparing for the siege of the city. The report came from the French camp of Rivoli on 23 May. The Turin report also contained information about the numbers of the Spanish army. Additionally, it presented rumors that the French army needed more than 15,000 mules to transfer oats and hay for the horses. The tone of the reports tried to be neutral the main goal here was not to provoke any reaction from either side. Nevertheless, the Gazette de Rotterdam showed a slight preference for the French side. From the report coming from the French camp in Rivoli, for instance, readers learned that peasants provided the camp with food. The report just mentioned the French deserters, not giving any other information whatsoever. The same news was also presented in the Leiden paper that was published the same day. Gazette de Leyde, however, presented the news from Turin's perspective. In that issue, readers could be informed that the Duke of Savoy, opening vote, shown his royal superiority as he distributed his own powder and lead to his subject. He is ready to defend it well, closing vote. The Duke also brought his guards into Turin and ordered women and children to leave the city. The Paris report emphasizes more the brave figure of the Duke, informing the readers that, opening vote, the Duke took every precaution imaginable to counter the effect of the bombing, closing the vote. Not surprisingly, La Gazette presented the news differently. In the issue published on 9 June 1696, we learned that the Duke of Savoy could not inspire his subjects, since the latter abandoned their homes without following his orders. Thus, it was more a decision of the people of Turin to leave the city rather than the Duke's order. The Gazette does not refer to any news about the number of deserters in the French army, unlike the two other Gazettes. On the other hand, Gazette d'Amsterdam tried to be neutral. It presented the same news as Gazette de Leyde and Gazette de Rotterdam did without showing any preference. On 17 June 1696, the Battle of Dogger Bank took place. It was a naval encounter between a French force under the command of the famous privateer Jean Bart and a squadron of Dutch ships acting as escort to a convoy of more than 100 merchant vessels. The outcome of the battle was a decisive victory for the French. La Gazette celebrated this victory in its issue published on 13 June. In fact, Efsev Renado created a new city's headline separating this report from all the others. Usually, all the reports coming from Dunkirk were appeared under the Paris report, but not this one. This one had its own report. Renado gave a full detailed information about Ma Bart's maneuver. The Gazette de Rotterdam also informed its clientele about this loss. But unlike the Turin's reports, this information was appearing in London report and covered just a few lines. The tone of the report was neutral, just delivering the information needed. After all, the Dutch naval forces were the one that had been defeated 
and the officers would not have been happy if one of the Gazettes celebrated. Unfortunately, these issues from the Gazette de Lade and Gazette de Amsterdam are missing. So how can we explain this diversity in the reports? One reason was the political or religious beliefs. Alexander Lafon, for instance, the editor of Gazette de Lade, was a strict Calvinist. He started his career as a copywriter in Gazette d'Amsterdam next to Van's Fall, and he continued in his steps. His son, Anthony de la Fond, continued his legacy. On the other hand, the new editor of the Gazette d'Amsterdam, Jean Trochy de Breil, was a close friend to Colbert de Torcy, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs. The most important reason, however, was economical, and more specifically, it was the circulation of these gazettes in France. French language gazettes were circulated in France in large numbers since the beginning of their emergence. It is not a coincidence that most of the surviving issues are in the French libraries and almost a few can be found in the Dutch ones. Paid advertisements provided gazettes with an additional income, an income which was crucial for their survival. Advertisements are also indirect sources for the historians about the wide circulation of the gazettes, since advertisers wanted to be advertised in papers which were famous in the local market. During the year 1677-1687, Gazette de Lait numbered 201 advertisements coming from Parisian merchants, booksellers, and others, while during the war, the Gazette numbered just one. The decline was enormous. On the contrary, the two Gazettes published by Dubreil the Gazette d'Amsterdam, a Requel de Nouvelles, which was a short venture and was published until 1693, counted 78 and 49 ads respectively. The war had also destroyed the extensive international networks that booksellers had created. These networks were thriving during 1677 and 1687, as they could diminish the cost of the ad for the advertisement. Their collapse had a major impact in Gazette's income. As a result, most of the Huguenot editors tried not to provoke the fence during the war in order to remain their circulation of their Gazettes in the pre-war standards. To conclude, the Huguenot Gazette printing the Dutch Republic from 1670s and onwards are a fruitful source of the political, diplomatic, and military events which took place in Europe in this period. The dissemination of news among the Huguenot communities helped the French language publishers to establish a news network which provides them with the latest news from Edinburgh and Dublin to Warsaw and Krakow. Despite difficulties, the gazetteers managed to have reports from camps and forces whenever that was possible. Although they usually use the same networks, many reports have different approaches, reflecting the political view of their editor. Every French gazetteer had a different attitude towards France. Many of these issues circulated among the upper class of French society, including the French court. Some of these gazettes, like the Gazette de Lade, had an anti-French rhetoric, but others, such as Gazette d'Amsterdam, had a neutral or even positive attitude towards France. This was not something unusual. The news market in the Netherlands was small and extremely competitive for the French gazettes. Therefore, Huguen gazetteers focused also on the huge French market, which was controlled by only one state journal. French advertisements published in the Huguen gazettes printed in the Dutch Republic proved the wide circulation among the middle and the upper French classes. As a result, many of these Huguen gazetteers needed to use a more neutral tone in how they wrote about France, since they feared that the French authorities would easily demand a ban of their gazettes from the French territories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fanny uh, Otis. It was a very absolutely fascinating um, uh, paper there. Um, I'd like to ask you more about advertisements, but again, I've got to hold off a little bit until, until the end. Our final speaker in this session is Dr. Uh, Lina uh, Liapi. Uh, um, sorry, Pines, could you uh, stop sharing your screen? Yes, yes I'm trying to. Okay, thank you. Uh, our fi final speaker is Dr. Lena Liapi, who also comes from uh, the University of Athens, where she 
obtained her, her BA and her master's. Uh, it seemed to be a very uh, uh, productive place, the University of Athens in recent years, isn't it? Uh, but she didn't uh, travel quite as far north as uh, uh, Panos, ending up in, in New York, where she completed her PhD. Uh, she's currently an honorary research fellow at the University of Peel, and her research revolves around cultures of communication, crime and urban history. Um, I have to say, uh, Lena, that you picked fantastic titles uh, for your research, uh, much more exciting than the titles that I normally pick. Her, 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 her book, um, published by Bald Boydell and Brewer in 2019, was called Roguery in Print, Crime and Culture in Early Modern London. Uh, she has now departed from that a little bit and, and begun to look at the, the kind of building and management of fame and reputation in the 17th and early 18th century. Uh, today, the title of her paper is The Land That Shakes and the Heavens Weep, Natural Disasters, and early modern news. Yeah. Thank you very much for this introduction. It was great. Um, I have two things to say before I start uh, my talk. One of them is that, as has been uh, obvious probably, I have a Greek accent and I speak fast. Okay. Uh, please bear this in mind. And if at some point it's too fast, let me know. Okay. I don't mind that. <clears throat> And the second thing is that this paper is extremely a uh, work in progress. Okay, uh, I, ha I have started. I have just started thinking about it. Uh, I have made the paper here. Hopefully, it will make sense. But I promise not much more from that. Okay, so let's give it a go. Uh, all right. Sorry, I'm just trying to set the time as well. Okay, so. Uh, I will start this paper with a personal story. When I first arrived in the UK from Greece to do a PhD, I visited my supervisor's office. It was a very small room filled from top to bottom with books in various shelves, leaving no space empty. My first horrified reaction uh, was asking him, if there is an earthquake, you know you will be buried in your books, right? To which he answered that, thankfully, there are almost no earthquakes in the UK. This was the first time that I realized that what to me had been a very common phenomenon, something you needed to bear in mind when you put you set up a bookcases in Greece, was quite alien, or at least not part of lived experience in the UK. We can assume that the same was true in early modern England. English scholars had read about earthquakes in the works of classical authors, authors most of whom hailed from Italy and uh, Greece, area, areas of high seismic activity. But other sets of English people would have had a more distant awareness of earthquakes, from the memory of the rare English earthquakes, from the Bible, from literature, and increasingly from news. The great increase in communication technologies in the 16th and 17th centuries allowed a wider range of individuals to learn about earthquakes happening in various parts of the globe, with greater emphasis, of course, to those parts of material interest. Uh, this is an exploratory paper which uh, will examine will examine the newspaper reportage of earthquakes in the late 17th century with two aims. The first is to show the extent to which newspapers attempted to portray their coverage of earthquakes as discourses of fact, as Barbara Shapiro argues, how they reported events as matters of fact, their attention to detail, and their reliance on credible sources. <coughs> the second aim is to show how this news of earthquakes from Europe and the New World, especially, and their emphasis on human suffering and terror had the potential to elicit an emotional response and the sense that the world was shrinking. Barbara Shapiro has analyzed newspapers as discourses of fact, stating that they claim to rely on credible witnesses, sorry, on credible witnesses to emphasize truth telling and impartiality, to reject, to reject fiction and to distinguish between a relation of matters of fact and commentary or conjecture on those facts. The portrayal of matter of fact was achieved through placing emphasis on particulars by talking about a specific event. A newspaper reports of earthquakes can be an illuminating example of Shapiro's thesis, as natural his uh, history was also a field on which discourses of fact were increasingly dominant. Even though theories about the cause of earthquakes were influenced by Aristotle's meteorologia, in the 17th century, new empiricism in science increasingly relied on, observ on observation and description of natural phenomena. Nonetheless, 
Aristotle's explanation of the causes of earthquakes was still dominant. According to it, under the influence of the heavens, the earth produces dry exhalations in the same way that waters, when heated, produces vapor. When such, when such dry exhalations get trapped within subterranean cavities, they move violently until they find a way to break out. This violent moving is felt as an earthquake. In the 17th century, due to the notions of empiricism, there was also increased emphasis on describing other associated phenomena, such as the changes in the weather and the skies. Newspapers commonly re reported matter of fact, giving specific details, such as the occurrence of an earthquake, its location, from the late 17th century also its precise time, and the effects of earthquakes. For example, how many people died, the damage to buildings and the landscape. But they also attempted to establish causal links between earthquakes, the weather, and other natural phenomena. These explanations hark back to earlier attempts to predict earthquakes by examining celestial bodies. Uh, and some newspapers describe associated phenomena, especially the weather, implying, the, that, sorry, implying that there was a connection between storms, for example, and earthquakes. A report of the earthquake in Ferrara in June 1681 highlighted that there was a great storm attended with thunder, lightning, and hailstones of an exceeding bigness, which did great damage in this part. And scarcely was the storm ending, but a very terrible earthquake began. An earthquake in Lyon, in June 1681, was also accompanied by a storm of hail and rain that the, light, sorry, that the like has not been known in that kingdom, for it rather seemed the falling of a water spout than a shower. Other associated natural phenomena were also reported, such as the rise of black vapor, sorry, black vapors and flames like to those of Mount Vesuvius, or the fact that four days before an earthquake in Naples, the sun appeared at 17 hours with a flame about it. And here, the previous one, we see also the influence of earthquakes and uh, volcanoes, actually. Uh, these descriptions were part of the ways of predicting earthquakes, uh, which in the 17th century had taken a more empirical slant with increasing emphasis on meteors and the weather. <coughs> Barbara Shapiro has argued that newspapers tried to bolster the claims of truth-telling and fidelity by using credible witnesses and by rejecting hearsay. However, this was often more of a promise than a reality. It was not always easy to find credible witnesses. Uh, so any kind of eyewitness account was desirable. In the case of earthquakes, it is rare that newspapers imply that the information comes from eyewitnesses. For example, uh, when reporting on earthquakes happening in Naples in, in June 1688, the London Gazette included the fir first person description. And this is one of the very few I have found actually. Uh, the seventh instant, we had had here another earthquake. The tenth, we again perceived the trembling of the earth. And on the 14th, felt a more violent shock, which threw down several houses, so that we fear that the earthquake, sorry, that the earthquake will continue on this moon, as that did, which happened in December 1456. Even though the account is coming, at least readers are left to assume, from an eyewitness, no attempt is made to ascertain their status or their credibility. More commonly, however, newspapers do not specifically mention where the information coming, is coming from, or so that this is a second-hand account, from example, from a report, or it is sent from Naples, etc., or a ship passing by the stricken area. <coughs> uh, newspapers showed an ambivalent stance when it came to hearsay, even though we saw that newspapers often had to rely on oral reports of dubious, of dubious provenance, they could also reject particular reports as hearsay when they didn't fit with their worldview. This is evident in the case of prodigies, which includes any event that was considered inexplicable or to have a supernatural, supernatural explanation, such as monsters or uh, monstrous births. Earthquakes could also be described as prodigious and, an sorry, and analyzed as an expression of God's wrath. Newspapers in general did not analyze earthquakes in those terms. But in the few cases where they did, we can see an ambivalent stance towards prodigies, which reflected some of the criticism, criticisms of 17th century thinkers. For example, the domestic intelligence in July 1679 mentions, there is a relation from Scotland of which we must expect a confirmation that on Thursday, the 10th day of this instant July, there happened a terrible storm of thunder and lightning accompanied with an earthquake, which shook the houses, sorry, which shook the houses in dreadful manner after which it is said that there were appearances of several shapes and figures 
and several persons that were in the fields do affirm that before the beginning of the tempest, they heard a terrible noise, like the bellowing of a bull. Uh, seeing figures in the sky was actually a quite common way of talking about portents of the future. Uh, here, the newspaper employs qualifying language. We expect confirmation, it is said, several persons do affirm. This report opts for no, non-committal language, neither accepting nor rejecting these claims. The same newspaper uh, was even more cautious in 1681 when presenting news of an earthquake in Lyon in 30 June. It remarked, several people affirm that they saw flames of fire ascending out of the earth, but it is imagined they might be deceived by the flashes of lightning that ran along the ground. Here, here we see a clearer example. Again, here we see a clearer example of the rejection of hearsay and of portents. Even though there are witnesses claiming that they saw something un unusual, the editor provides an explanation rooted in natural history. <clears throat> the true Protestant Mercury is more direct in February 1681 when it uh, mentions that there is like likewise a noise of an earthquake near experts, but we are sparing to credit visions and prodigies. We can see then that newspaper reporters in the second half of the 17th century validates to an extent Shapiro's thesis. There is emphasis on matter of fact and the rejection of hearsay. However, it is also evident that both dubious witnesses and hearsay could be accepted or at least accommodated when there was no fuller news to be had. In addition, editors chose what to brand as hearsay uh, or uh, prodigy, actually. Another issue of the domestic intelligence in the next month from the one I mentioned before, and you can see it here, uh, actually included the record of the monster stating that we have had it reported for a certain truth. <clears throat> and here's the second part of the paper. The increase in the reports of earthquakes in newspapers did not just bolster the status as discourse of fact, as ring vermids, I have no idea how this name is pronounced, apologies here. Uh, the more such descriptions were published, the more people became aware that earthquakes and other unusual phenomena on a global scale were actually pretty common events. This is evident in the domestic intelligence of 1679 here, which noted, it is remarkable that about the same time when that terrible whirlwind and earthquake happened in the empire, of which we gave an account in our last, it appears to be near the time when the earthquake happened in Scotland, which did not come there. Uh, as, also the, uh, as also the time of that dreadful thunder and lightning which we had in England, the like whereof had, had, been seldom, sorry, had been seldom seen, which demonstrates that the tempest was very large and general throughout Europe. <coughs> this realization that earthquakes could happen anywhere and that they were a more common phenomenon than they may appear at first, became more prominent with newspaper coverage. The increase in the reporters of, in the reporters of natural catastrophes could desensitize readers in the same way that the overflowing of news of disasters today makes it more difficult to empathize with all the victims. I would like to argue that there is another possible reading of the increase in reporters of earthquakes. Printed pamphlets or histories about earthquakes focused on human pain, which could elicit reactions of sympathy from their audience. Even newspapers, which dedicated less space in the description of earthquakes, and as, we, and as we have seen, often reported matter of fact, frequently highlighted human suffering. <clears throat> in my preliminary investigation of newspapers reporting on earthquakes between 1645 and 1696, and I need to stress here that I have not fully covered this period, I have found 50 earthquake reports and in them, 22 usages of the adjective terrible. This is by far the most common adjective to describe earthquakes with a few mentions of great or most dreadful. Evoking the terror that such an event caused was clearly an important part of the description of earthquakes. In the same vein, they often presented the terrified reactions of those caught in the midst of the earth shaking and everything collapsing. For example, when reporting, when reporting an earthquake in August 1679, the friendly intelligence reported, from Scotland, it is advised there has been a terrible earthquake between Lithgow Bridge towards Glasgow, which continued a very considerable, 
a very considerable season to the great amazing and affrightment of those people. A sense of surprise and terror is also evident in the true Protestant Mercury of May 1681, which brings tidings of an earthquake, earthquake in Candia. A, a great earthquake lately happening here, which has struck the whole island with very great terror and amazement and has done a great deal of mischief. Newspapers often mention the number of those killed or wounded, as well as their feelings of helplessness. In an earthquake reported in the London, London Gazette in 1680, it is described that um, the earthquake, sorry, how the, uh, sorry, it is described how the shaking of the earth in Madrid caused a terrible desolation uh, and details of the stricken individuals are included. 112 persons were wounded and 40 known to be killed, besides others who it is feared may lie buried under the ruins. Here, it is not just the death count, but also the fear of being buried alive that is being highlighted. Similarly, an earthquake in Lorraine was presented thus. <coughs> From Lorraine, we have the relation of a terrible earthquake, which happened there on the 15th, and that continued to shake the earth very furiously for the space of half an hour, in which time about 680 houses were demolished and a great number very much ruinated. Several persons being killed and wounded, both in their houses and as they fled through the streets to their no small consternation. This relation focuses not only on the damaged coast, but also on the feelings of those caught in the middle of this catastrophe. It invites the reader to imagine how such individuals must have felt running for their lives. The same feel feeling is portrayed in the newspaper reportage of the earthquake in Naples in 1688. <clears throat> on Saturday last, the fifth instant, about the uh, 22nd hour, happened here a dreadful earthquake, though it lasted not long which frightened the inhabitants out of their houses with a terror of an sorry, with a terror of an inevitable destruction, they betook themselves to the piazzas and the open public places of the city. A representative example of this evocation of the suffering of those experiencing an earthquake was the report as of the 1688 earthquake in Smyrna. By the way, the, the image is not from this one. It's from um, Jamaica, actually. Uh, Smyrna was a port in the Ottoman Empire. So news took a considerable time to reach London. There are at least five newspaper issues which deal with what happened in Smyrna in a space of four months. And with each report, uh, the suffering of those who died is presented dramatically. The first report talked about a most prodigious earthquake where several thousands of the inhabitants per perished. A few weeks later, the number of people killed increased to above 30,000 souls perished by the late dreadful earthquake at Smyrna. The London Gazette uh, downplayed the number of people killed, saying that the most moderate computation of people destroyed is 5,000, but added uh, but that details about how many poor people uh, were burned in the ruins before they could get help, because this earthquake actually caused a fire as well. Even in December of the same year, a ship that stopped in Smyrna brought the same tidings. The ship Angel gives a dismal relation. What a deplorable condition that city lies under through the effects of the earthquake. <clears throat> we cannot say with certainty uh, how readers would react to such news. And, and it's one of the things that I would like actually to find eventually. It is evident that there was significant interest in how these faraway, faraway events affected them. In the coverage of the Smyrna earthquake, sufficient space is dedicated to how this natural phenomenon has harmed the financial, financial prospects of English merchants. In the same way as in the, um, the earthquake in Jamaica, there is a lot about how the sugar plantations were destroyed, actually. Nonetheless, the emphasis on both the casualties and the suffering caused, as well as on the feelings of surprise, terror, and helplessness experienced by the victims could strike a chord with the readers. <clears throat> the number of earthquakes reported created a sense of dread, but also a possibility to empathize with others. In 1688 alone, judging by English newspaper reports, 10 earthquakes in different parts of the globe were made known to readers. That's, thus, it should not surprise us that there was concern about such pan-European or broader phenomena. A good example of a reaction to this deluge of new news was the editor's commentary on a true and impartial account of the remarkable accidents, casualties, and other transactions of the like nature happening in city and country in 1688. <clears throat> I cannot conclude paper the paper better 
than by, by giving God thanks for the blessings of this climate of England, that when all the other parts of the world are more or less subject, subjected to the miseries of inundation, hurricanes, eruptions of fire, and terrible earthquakes, we are seldom or never exposed to those calamities. As we have heard sorry, uh, of terrible earthquakes in Peru and the like lately at Naples, to instance only in the late devastation of Smyrna, where off by letters of first date, we receive a very melancholy account. The right that the earthquake there has not only greatly defaced and ruined that flourishing place, but destroyed many of the factories, together with the lives and estates of some of the eminent persons, turning that famous trading city into a heap of ruin and devastation. The editor here enumerates some of the, some of the most spectacular and terrifying natural catastrophes which took place in that year. His conclusion may be a pat in the back, congratulating his country for its climate, but it's also an acknowledgement of others' pain and suffering. In conclusion, uh, newspapers attempted to present the reportage of earthquakes as a discourse of fact, making claims of fidelity and of reporting matter of fact. Nonetheless, we can see glimpses of the influence of contemporary theories of the cause of earthquakes, which meant that newspapers were also willing to include interpretation and judgment instead of just facts. This was rare, however. More commonly, the issue with their claims of truth telling was that they had to rely on dubious, dubious sources and witnesses. Newspaper editors highlighted, the, highlighted this and used qualifying language when they could not be certain. At the same time, they chose which accounts to reject completely as hearsay or prodigies, even if other accounts they received and incorporated in their news offering could also be presented as such. <clears throat> Additionally, this matter of fact reportage did not preclude emotional reactions to the news. I am not trying to make a crude distinction here between fact and fiction or rational and emotional, but to show how, rather than necessarily desensitizing readers due to the increase in such reports, the emphasis on death, terror, and suffering could also elicit reactions of sympathy, commiseration, or understanding, a feeling that these events resulted in the suffering of others. This could be the case, even if some of these reactions were also followed by the familiar, thankfully would not have earthquakes in England. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lena, and thank you to all of our speakers in this session. I thought that that was a absolutely fascinating. Now, if I could, I could just ask if anybody has got uh, questions, please uh, let me know. Um, I can't see all of your faces on the on the Zoom uh, profile. Um, I'm going to abuse the uh, privilege of chair to ask uh, a few quick fire questions of my own. Um, first of all, to Eamon, I'm really interested in the illustrations which you uh, showed uh, there, and particularly um, the comment that you made that, of, of the kind of reuse of imagery from Las Casas. By reuse, do you mean using the same um, iconography or a reuse of the actual woodcuts? Rosanna had a question uh, for you, which uh, related to uh, whether there's a, there's a kind of Dutch equivalent of Pierre de la Toile. I mean, one of the things that's really striking in terms of the, the context of news is the way people hear about news, absorb it, make sense of it. And the Toile's very good at going through a range of different media by which pe people experience news. But I just wondered whether there was an equivalent elsewhere, because he seems quite extraordinary as, a, as, as an individual. Uh, Panagiotta is really interested in the advertisements that would be put in uh, by the uh, Paris merchants and booksellers and so on. And I, I just wondered whether there was anything that was surprising in terms of what was being advertised. Is it, is it just books or is it products as well? Uh, what's the most common product that's being, be, being advertised? And, um, and Lena, I thought that your, your um, uh, uh, presentation was excellent as well. And um, it, it, while it tended to focus on, on newspapers, I wonder whether you had um, had a sense uh, too of the kind of pamphlet culture of these, these events. And it, it, is there a tipping point where these, these, these pamphlets become more critical, more empirical in, in the phrase, is, the, is the phrase that you used uh, of, of you know, interpreting these events as portents of God's um, uh, anger or, or otherwise? Um, we go. Uh, Eamon, would you like to? Sure, yeah, oh, thank you. Um, 
So the point I was making there about uh, the imagery of violence, um, it's rooted in the second book of Kings. Um, that, 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 that image is rooted in the second book of Kings. You, those of you who are keen Shakespeare scholars will recognize it from Lady Macbeth as well, uh, Lady Macbeth's speech as well, where she talks about plucking the child from the, bre uh, from the breast and dashing the children's head against the stones. Um, so it's a well-known trope, um, so much so that it, it appears in witness statements in the 1641 depositions. Now, whether those statements have been heavily mediated by the Church of Ireland clergymen who took them or not, I don't know. I mean, this is the issue we face when we're talking about witness testimonies. Now, in terms of the reuse of woodcuts, that is the, a really interesting question because the, 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 the unsatisfactory answer is that we don't know. It, what Holler is credited with the woodcuts from the Thirty Years' War, but whether he made the same woodcuts for the 1641 rebellion or not is, is unclear. And to me, I think there's a different person. I used to think it was Holler, but the, there's such considerable difference and variation in the two. That I'm not 100%. I, 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 if you were to put a gun to my head, I would say no, um, but you don't. So I'm going to be far more circumspect and say I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Haven. Uh, Roseanne? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sandy. Um, I think our, well, Pierre Letal, of course, is, is extraordinary. His diaries are, are a rich source. Um, I think there are various equivalents of him in, in the Netherlands. There's a, there's a priest in Amsterdam who writes about his ex anxiety um, uh, in dealing with news and uh, about the Jacobs is his name. Um, so he's a very, uh, well, beautiful example of someone who deals with bad news. Um, there are several diaries in Antwerp and Ghent. So the major cities, there are some, some other chroniclers who do engage in, uh, with news in the way that Pierre Letoil did. Um, well, there's also someone in Cologne, I don't know, Hermann Weisberg, who's also a, a diarist who really, well, um, with an obsession recorded all news he heard. Um, but that's the German Empire. But yes, so yeah, I can see some some uh, other examples who record um, the events the way Pierre Letal did. Yes. Thanks, uh, Razan. Uh, Fanny Otis. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so the, there are very interesting things with uh, these uh, uh, networks. So in, in the slides, I use networks that contain booksellers, um, uh, collaboration of three or more booksellers. So during uh, the war, there are still some uh, collaboration with uh, booksellers, but in a local market. So I found out that uh, uh, booksellers from Amsterdam will collaborate with booksellers in Leiden, one or two, or in The Hague, or in the same city. Most of the of the products are books, all of the products are books, or are new edition of a, a book or a new book pro product, but all are books, nothing else. I have found also uh, during the trust between 1697 and 1701, um, a network of um, uh, friends uh, mostly, um, uh, merchants, uh, about the steel of, uh, um, I don't remember exactly, steel of, uh, um, of a necklace, if I remember correctly. So this uh, network just um, advertised uh, the, the steel of the net necklace in everywhere, in Brussels, um, uh, in Amsterdam, in Leiden. So everyone who has any information about that he could easily go uh, to one of these uh, merchants in Amsterdam or in Brussels, in Leiden, in Paris, in Marseille too. But about um, uh, the bookseller um, uh, network, it was only about books, nothing else. Um, and uh, Lena. All right, okay, yeah. Uh, this is a good question uh, in terms of uh, pamphlet culture, et cetera. Uh, I have not read as many pamphlets as I would like to, but what is characteristic about pamphlets in general is that obviously when there is a significant earthquake or something similar, there is a lot of pamphlet literature coming out about it. Uh, 
and because there's a lot of more space to analyze events here, they tend to have far more interpretation. Uh, here, actually, the religious framework is more obvious normally, where there is this idea of, you know, is it God's wrath? What does it show about the future, etc.? Is it a sign of God's providence? These kind of questions. Um, so I think, and also it depends on the pamphlet again. Okay, so clearly different people are writing because they have different agendas here, uh, which is also true when it comes to newspapers, obviously, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I, I'm not entirely clear about how far we can say that there is a, a similar sense of, you know, how do you, they explain earthquakes? And I would like to do more research on that. Uh, what I found interesting with this one is actually newspapers are not supposed to say much, and sometimes they say plenty, which is what I find interesting. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Well, we've got a whole barrage of questions, so it's a very, going to be very lively. I'll, I'll take them in the order that I spotted them. And uh, I think, Brendan, you were first. Okay, thanks. Um, this is just uh, um, uh, attempting to grasp the um, uh, sort of some of the uh, major questions. I was thinking about um, Lena Liapi's affirmation about um, newspaper reportage as uh, a discourse of fact. Uh, of course, um, Barbara Shapiro goes a little bit further than um, mentioning this as, as simply a discourse. Uh, she does uh, attempt to suggest that the, um, these are places where one must, one may indeed find facts. But I think what you've, um, what all of the papers in this panel have suggested is the conditioning of the reportage of fact on the basis of a number of different um, variables. So for instance, in Iman Darcy's um, uh, discussion, it's a question of, of um, partiality and where does this partiality come from in terms of which side are you on basically. Um, Roseanne Barr is talking about dissimulation. So the sources you're working with um, may attempt to show a certain uh, being on a certain side because of the market that they're in. And some like the Gazette uh, d'Amsterdam attempt to be uh, a little bit less um, obviously uh, partial also for uh, reasons of, um, of, of um, market um, uh, concerns. Uh, and Lina Lapis, um, conditioning of fact comes from, uh, in a way, uh, what I thought was a kind of of um, of, of selectivity of um, which uh, events are we going to report, uh, and I found it very interesting the increase in reports on uh, on earthquakes, which raises the question of of um, in the uh, let's say on the horizon of experience, what are the things that are perceived? Obviously the news can't cover everything. So uh, whether or not the, um, the reporting itself is somehow related to actual experience having been felt by, by people or observed by people, um, there are a, also a matter of partiality is simply ignoring certain things that um, either are too far away or they're boring or uh, which reminds me about um, um, Eamon Darcy's um, inference that um, if it doesn't bleed it doesn't lead in other words if there's no war or there's no terrible disaster who's going to read it so there's a certain amount of pressure on, on actually getting to features like that so comments from anyone Please. I can give it a go uh, in two ways. Uh, I mean, yes, I wasn't trying to entirely uh, agree with Shapiro here, even though not necessarily. I think that newspapers give the appearance of fact, and uh, but they make particular choices that they're not always um, they don't be always put under this umbrella. They decide, it's what you said actually, they decide what they want to report on and how, which events they think or which interpretations they think are factual and which are not. And the difference is sometimes baffling, if nothing else. Uh, the other thing about the horizon of experience, I think 
I wanted to come at least to English newspapers, which is the only thing I can with any kind of uh, assurance talk about. I think part of it is, has to do with how far English interests reach, and the more the century um, progresses, the, the greater interest they have in a lot of different places, which is why, for example, this is one of the things that I kind of mentioned offhandedly and didn't actually analyze, which is the fact that they also talk about how merchants and English merchants are going to be um, influenced, uh, affected by this kind of earthquake. So there is clearly an interest in general in natural philosophy because they are kind of you know, sellable, I think, either way, but also an interest in talking about specific places which are more of a, have more of a material interest for people. That would be kind of my contribution here. I think uh, David had a, had a question. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for all your fantastic papers. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Darcy, but before I have also good news in the sense that uh, when you were talking about neglected sources, I've been approaching this time with the uh, a visit, handwritten new sheet um, written by Amerigo Salvetti, who was the Tuscan resident in London on the Irish rebellion. And there are full of news about the Irish rebellion. And also what is interesting in, in, in what you said is that we got, he got the, 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 the news about the same time of uh, around November. And what happened after November, about the 15th of November that uh, his house was stormed by 60 people who actually were searching for Catholic uh, books or whatever. And he was forced actually to leave his house and to go to Cancio, which was actually, which is actually Kent where he, continue to uh, send information to, to news, handwritten news sheet to Florence. From Cancio, he gave information on the Irish rebellion. So now, just to uh, point out this kind of connection between you know, the history of Ireland, which is also the history of all the region, right? So, yeah. and also these information were actually also used by other historian like Vittorio Siri while writing their big history on contemporary stuff. So I would like to point out this kind of di dialectic and of, of news and on content of news. And my question for you, that was could be also the question for the first panel of, of uh, yesterday. So mm -hmm. as an Irish scholar, you actually made the point. So seems to me that the historiography has stressed a lot on some points. So my point is, there are certain regions where scribal culture has a predominant rule mm -hmm. uh, in compared to other kind of central uh, uh, country. So mm -hmm. I think that Ireland is one of these ones. So, uh, so my, 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 my point is on, uh, if you can elaborate a bit more on this kind of, you know, uh, you know, the way in which news circulated in Ireland also on this kind of tragic events and my, my question, is, my, my, my point is that the, the status of writings of scribal culture in Ireland is, uh, is very important and, and should be uh, as also in Europe, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. what's your point with it? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, David, thank you very much. I'd love to hear more about those. Uh, those letters you were describing, absolutely fascinating. I hope I can email you after this to, to discuss it further. Um, in terms of your point about scribal culture, it is absolutely fascinating what is going on uh, in Ireland in the 1640s in terms of European networks. So one thing that I find very interesting is that when we look at this through the prism of language, uh, you see that there are very deliberate news stories being circulated among, deliberate, among audiences. So the Confederates, for example, among English audiences, English speaking audiences. So this is, the, this is what they're printing in Ireland. And the more I look into this, the more I realize the audience isn't an Irish audience, it's an English audience, because effectively what they are saying is acceptable in, and, and I say that tentatively to English speaking audiences in England about the status of the Catholic Church. Meanwhile, there are very clear letters uh, uh, being sent to the, 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 the huge uh, 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 transnational uh, expatriate Irish uh, uh, community on the continent. There are letters being sent to France, to Spain, 
uh, and they're using clerical mer and mercantile as well as military connections here to disseminate news about the rebellion. And what they're saying in these other languages are very, is very different to what's being said in the English language. So, for example, there are there are uh, wonderful scribal letters in uh, the, 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 the the academy in Madrid, where effectively this is a brilliant that is is a defense of the church. We are trying to restore the church. They're saying this quite clearly to Spanish audiences in Spanish, but they would never dream of saying that in English. And actually, that's that was one of the points that I was trying to make before the car crash of my technical hitches was that actually, you know, they didn't admit to that in English until quite late, until about 1646. Now, if I can answer briefly about the scribal, I know we're caught for time. You're absolutely right about scribal publications being very important in Ireland, but in the Irish language, they don't take the form that you would expect them to take. And normally these are poems that are written in a very clear way that they use, I suppose, it's a bit like a uh, 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 Parry Lord, uh, uh, that idea of the oral formulated compositions, but these are easily memorable and easily then transmitted. And so a lot of that world has been lost, it's ephemeral. So what you're hoping is that these people have, that someone has recorded these poems, and that's not always the case. Um, I hope that answers it, David, but I, I suspect we'll be an email contact. So if it doesn't, we can talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It, time is running quite short, so if I could just ask uh, the, the remaining uh, questioners, you could try to keep your, your, your points as brief as possible so that we don't run into lunchtime. Uh, I think, Melina, you were, you were next. Thank you, thank you. And congratulations to all the panellists, because it was very interesting, all the your contributions. I have a question, just a brief question to Lena. Uh, it's just in uh, in this religious framework framework and um, I mean in the human reaction that you have find uh, I'm wondering if you have find some reference and evidences regarding religious practices that people uh, organize collectively um, procession or some kind of um, uh, Oratoran, uh, um, like prayer collectively, just like uh, we have seen in the first uh, image that you put on uh, in your presentation, we have seen in the center of the composition a collective prayer. So I'm wondering if you have find in your sources these, uh, these kind of references. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, Yes, I mean, I think uh, there are two examples that come to mind. One of them is from Naples, with their, their mention for session specifically in the newspapers as well. And there's a tiny bit of that. What surprised me in general is that there is almost no mentions of uh, religion in the newspapers. Normally, there is one exception, and I think this is characteristic, though. It's the Jamaica one, which is the one that you're talking about from the pamphlet as well, the image one. I think what happens with the Jamaica one is that all the information they have is from one of the uh, clerics, the priests, uh, the, I'm sorry, preachers, I've lost the word, Protestant priests, I lost it completely, it's embarrassing, sorry, you get the point, uh, who is actually writing a whole narrative about the earthquake in Jamaica, and he talks about how this is, um, this shows the wrath of God, uh, and in the in his pamphlets that are published from his accounts, this is very clear and very obvious that he thinks that uh, the people are to blame, it's the earthquake in Jamaica is in Port Royal, so which is full of pirates. So clearly, this is uh, you know a punishment for their sins. Uh, but the thing is that actually in the newspaper reports of that, which is very again brief, it's clear it's coming from them because he says, "Oh, God has spared us, uh, etc." And thank God we didn't go worse than that. And the government here is doing everything they can. So clearly, this is part of a very has a very clear agenda, both religious one and is slightly, you know, uh, colonialist, I guess, uh, to show that. So again, there is that there, there is very clearly there because someone wants to make it a point, I think. Thank you. Uh, George, you are next. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, everyone, for an excellent session. Um, I have a question for Eamon about the stage management of news in Westminster. Um, 
Uh, first of all, a suggestion that you add to the timeline, the 29th of November, 1641, which is when the first newspaper appears, um, because that's probably stage managed by Pym, and that's part of getting uh, uh, polarising within par Parliament. So I think that kind of fits really neatly into your argument about what Pym's up to. But my, my question is about where Thomas Waring fits into this. Um, you showed the title page of his brief narration, which is the, the report that contains the highest uh, uh, number of, of, of fatalities uh, in all of the um, English propaganda uh, about the Irish Rebellion. And yet, yet Waring um, is a clerk taking depositions in Dublin in the, in the spring and summer of 1642. So I wonder where he fits into your story of the manipulation of, of news from Ireland in Westminster and whether actually there is a, there is a connection between Pym and, and Waring. Um, thank you very much, Joad. Um, I did not mean to infer that, that I thought there was a connection between Pym and Waring is the, is, is, is the, is the, short, is the short answer there. Waring is quite interesting. Uh, his, his publications in the late 1640s and early 1650s clearly are trying to serve a, 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 an agenda, but more specifically within Ireland and the nature of the Cromwellian settlement after the rebellion. Um, I'm conscious of time, but Joe, I'm more than happy to, even to, to, to talk to you over email about this. You know, um, very good question. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. And for, and for that tip about the 29th of November publication, thank you. We're really running short of time now, but if, if your questions are quick, Andre and uh, Lorenza, perhaps we could just squeeze you in at the end here. Uh, you're on mute, Andre. Uh, my question will be very quick and to the point. Uh, thanks everyone for these amazing papers. They were very, very interesting. I have a question for Rosanne, if she is still there. Yes, yeah. I'm still here. So two, uh, two very quick questions. For, uh, one, do you think that uh, you mentioned that um, one of the criteria in terms of um, a te a te a te a testimony to be uh, reliable is who, uh, who is the witness, basically? So uh, given the very heated um, landscape, uh, religious landscape in uh, early modern um, Netherlands. Do you think that uh, um, an, an Armenian uh, a clergyman would have, been more, uh, would have been thought as unreliable from a, from a Gomerist perspective? And second, is, what is the role of women in the consumption of news? Because you said that usually it was men, uh, wealthy cis men who were actually uh, more keen on um, a con a consuming news. Uh, th uh, thank you for your insights. Thank you, Sandy. I can answer this very quickly. <laughs> uh, first, yes, I have some examples of, uh, for instance, of the sieges that, that people expressly sent Protestant clergymen or Protestant messengers to uh, Protestant uh, army camps to tell news. So um, um, yes, they were not convinced uh, uh, by messengers from the other side. So you see uh, various instances of, of people doing just that or, or uh, priests arriving in a city and mm -hmm. are, well, they also are quoted by other priests. So uh, yes. And to the second, yes, I've only had have one, a diary of one woman, a nun. Mm -hmm. Um, and the rest are all men. Yes, I, I can't help it. I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I've searched for other uh, chronicles, um, but the, yeah, for the men who were very elaborately uh, writing um, diaries in this period at last. Thank you. For this Thank suggestion. you anyway. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Lorenza, last but not least. Thank you very much to uh, all the speakers uh, for their excellent papers. I have a very, very quick question <laughs> for Lena. Lena, you mentioned the relationship between volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, uh, and rightly so. So my question is concerned with what's uh, during the 17th century perceived on within a European context as the, the most catastrophic natural disasters of the century. And that was the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that occurred for a long period of time between December 1631 and January 
1632. It was a terribly long and disastrous eruption with, uh, which lasted for more than two weeks. So, and which had a, a, a European impact in terms of uh, dissemination of news and events. So I wonder whether you have come across this event in your research? research? Uh, thank you very much for that, actually. Uh, no is the very short answer to that, mostly because uh, the new newspapers, they're almost uh, the newspapers looked at either way are from the 1640s or onwards. So there are mentions of Mount Vesuvius a couple of times when they're talking about earthquakes or and I think I mentioned at some point, or you know, the eruption of Mount Etna as well, this sense that this was kind of, you know, the Mount Vesuvius one was a very catastrophic event that they basically remember about it, but I haven't actually looked at any examples of reporters from this period. And it's slightly more difficult because there are no newspapers in that sense. So it's, got, it's going to be slightly more tricky to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, all, all that's, that's left for me really to do is to thank all of our speakers and of course everyone who's uh, made, made a comment or asked a question. Uh, I thought that was an absolutely terrific uh, session. So if you'd like to join me in a virtual round of applause for everyone, that would be great. And we'll meet back again in an hour's time. Bye Thank you. Cheers. Bye.